Thank you, praise team. Hey, listen, if you were here this last Wednesday and you made a commitment concerning encouragement and encouragement card, remember they're right there on the tech booth in case you have forgotten. Thank you. So we are in our last week before we actually jump into the churches. Let me ask you a question this morning, the seven churches in Revelation. Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen or experienced anything that so overwhelmed you that you dropped to the ground as if you were dead? Has that ever happened to you? I mean, we've all been startled. Something may have brought fear in our life, but has something so overwhelmed you, bam, you hit the deck and you dropped like you were dead? I don't mean something that you saw or heard that took your breath away, but something that almost took your life away. Anything like that? I personally have never experienced something of that magnitude. But we're going to see today that the Apostle John did. (laughs) All right? He found himself so engulfed, he found himself so overwhelmed by what he saw that he lost control of his body, so to speak, and he fell to the ground as if he'd been shot in the head. We've seen, you've seen that stuff on TV. I hope you don't watch that. But instant, bam. Wow. And that was when he was seeing Christ. I mean, when you think of this and what John is saying, isn't this the Jesus who upon this earth John had known with such familiarity? The Jesus that he walked with and talked with and ate with? I mean, he was one of the Lord's closest inner circle. He was one of the three, the inner circle. I mean, wasn't this Jesus that John had intimately fellowshiped with at the Last Supper when he said to the Lord, which is the one that will betray you, Lord? Why did he fall down like the life had been sucked right out of him if this was that Jesus he knew? Well, we're going to see that John had a vision of the resurrected Jesus Christ in all his glory. And he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man in Revelation 1.17. You remember two weeks ago when we started this series, John had seen Jesus transfigured where he saw a glimpse of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? And God said in Matthew 17.5, he said, as Peter was talking, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Then verse 6 says, when the disciples heard this, they fell down to the ground and were terrified. Twice now, John has fallen down in the presence of God. But this time, seeing Jesus in all his glory, he added, I fell like a dead man. Well, in our introduction this far to the Hear Jesus series, in which Jesus is going to be speaking to the seven churches, and he will be speaking to us today, we have looked by way of preparation about this word hear. Hear Jesus. What does that mean? We've looked at how to hear Jesus and why we should hear Jesus. So this morning, let's look at the one who speaks to the seven churches. Let's look at the Jesus we will hear. When we're done today, you're basically going to have everything concerning Christ here on the who, what, where, when, why, and how. So that when we come together next week to actually hear what Jesus says, we will understand exactly what that means and who we're hearing. So turn with me and let's read the Word of God together. We're going to have a quite a bit of scripture today. I don't really know when to tell you that because we always are in scripture, but it feels scripture heavy to me today, which is good. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. 
And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Wow. Let's go to the Lord here, and let's pray. Lord, I just do pray and thank you that we are gathered here together to worship you. Lord, to know you better, to learn your word, to allow your word through your spirit to impact our lives. I pray we hear exactly what you want us to hear in your word, apply it to our life, to be useful instruments in your hands. I thank you, Lord, for the songs that we were able to sing to you. I pray you were pleased by them and for these dear babies dedicated to you. Lord, I pray that you will strengthen us all to be the children of God, your children that you'd have us be. In your name we pray, amen. So we're going to look at some things today and uh, who, who we are to be hearing. We want to see some things the Word says about Jesus. These last three weeks have been everything about Jesus. First, I want you to see the description of Jesus. What an amazing description John lays out. Nowhere in these verses do we read or see the name Jesus. Yet we know that the person John is describing here in the text, in this vision, is in fact Jesus Christ. He starts out in verse 13 saying, I saw one like a son of man. You see that? This is the same name, son of man, that Daniel, five centuries earlier, said, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This is the same Son of Man. So Son of Man is not only a designation that points to Christ's humanity, it is also a designation which points to his messianic divinity. And we actually saw that back in Christmas when we looked at the Virgin Mary. This was our Lord's favorite designation of himself. Why? Because he used it over 80 times in Scripture referring to his, himself. Only one other time did any human being speak of Jesus as the Son of Man. It, every other time it is of the Lord himself. And that one other time was Stephen when he was being killed for his testimony for following Christ as the first martyr in Christendom. He was about to die, Stephen was. He was being stoned to death. Stones were hitting him. They were pinging off of him. He was near death. When he looked up into heaven and seeing Jesus as he pulled away the veil, he said, Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. We know this is Jesus Christ. This is the resurrected Jesus Christ here. This is the Son of Man. This is the Son of God. Now, please understand what I'm about to say going forward here as we look at this description of the Lord. You see, the description of Jesus that follows is, symbol is a symbolic representation of the attributes of Jesus Christ. 
in a special relationship to the events that are pictured in the book of the Revelation as a whole, okay? And especially to each of the seven churches, as we're going to see in the upcoming weeks. So in 113, the first thing we see is Jesus Christ as judge and priest as pictured by his robe that reaches to his feet. This is the garment of a judge. And it's the golden sash of the high priest. It is a solemn note when you think about it. It's a solemn note at the outset of the book of Revelation. Here comes his honor in his robe and priestly sash. This is a court scene. And we see this court scene in Daniel 7, 9 through 10, where it says, I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The hair of his head like pure wool. The court sat, and the books were open. Wow. And you picture here the judge coming in with his long, flowing robe. And he comes in. Here is the judge of the universe taking his seat upon the bench, upon his throne. He has the robe of authority and the sash across his chest of priestly righteousness, of purity and perfection. Daniel said his hair was like pure wool. And notice what John now says. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. Is that how you picture Jesus? What does white hair picture? It is a picture here, the wisdom that should accompany the aged. This is the same description of God Almighty, the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7. The Jesus we will hear is the fount of all wisdom. The Jesus we are going to hear possesses and has all wisdom. Therefore, his judgments are always perfect. John looks at this hair and he looks down to his eyes and says, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Pictures our Lord's omniscience, his all-knowing, where nothing escapes his piercing gaze. This is the omniscience of God Almighty. His eyes are so bright, they expose everything, and he sees and knows all. There is no deception can lay, be laid before him. There can be no excuse left before him. There can be no lie before him. His eyes of fire see and know everything. We will see this when we actually come to the church of Thyatira. The Hebrew says there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All men will have to do something with Christ. All men will either deny him or choose him. And he knows and sees everything with his piercing gaze. You see, we often deceive ourselves. This Jesus we will hear already knows everything about us. There's nothing, nothing that he does not know about you. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows every sin committed. He knows every thought. He knows every heart attitude. He knows everything. It's all laid bare before him. For Jesus will address each of the seven churches with these opening words. I know. It just takes away all excuses. When you go up to your child and say, hey, listen, come here, I got a question for you. And by the way, I already know. Those little suckers will still lie. <laughs> hmm. 
John now looks down and he sees his feet. And in verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace. Have you ever seen metal coming out of the forge glowing red hot? You see, the bronze, burning, glowing feet speak of the righteous divine judgment that will go forth with all the power to back it up. This speaks of the righteous divine ju judgment we saw back in the When Jesus series upon the world where in Psalm 97, 3 states that fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries. We saw in the When Jesus series the trials, the tribulation that's coming upon the world and his ultimate judgment upon a rebellious world who will not accept his love. And then John hears something. He's now been seen and now he hears. His voice was like the sound of many waters. Many here may have been to Niagara Falls, or you may have been near a waterfall, or you heard the roar of a waterfall, or you've been at the ocean on a storm and heard the waves crashing against the sea, the uh, seashore. And you hear that mighty breaking roar of water then maybe we may somewhat understand and realize the force and the power of it. His voice was like the sound of many waters, meaning when he spoke, what's this symbolizing? It pictures power and authority, which commands, and not only commands, it demands obedience. God demands our obedience. This is a God who is going to judge all mankind for their refusal to obey, for their refusal to submit to him, for their refusal to accept him and disobey the gospel, the good news of Christ, when he gave it to them so freely to have. This is the meaning of the sword that comes out of his mouth in Revelation 19.15 that it says that will strike down the nations. Wow. After these descriptive details, John, now he just focuses on the Lord's face in verse 16, and it says, his face was like the sun shining in its strength. It's in the full strength of the shining uh, uh, sun. It speaks of his total glory. The glory of God. Wow, that's a lot to break down. That's a lot to take in. I had to ask myself and ask yourself, how do you think of Jesus? How do you think of Jesus? But here, in this scripture here, that John fell down like a dead man, Jesus is in his robe, his golden sash is across his chest with hair white as wool and snow, with flaming eyes and bronzed feet out of the furnace, with the crashing voice of mighty water and a face that outsigned the sun. This is not somebody who is just a good person to listen to who has good advice. We often treat the Lord as if it's just good advice, take it or leave it. This is who we are to hear. This is the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise judge of the universe. This is the glorious ancient of days. This is the Alpha and the Omega, God Almighty, who is going to bring about judgment as a consuming fire onto all rebellion. This is him. Now that brings into me some very sharp clarity, some very sharp clarity, and it makes very plain sense concerning John's statement about how he responded. Is it any wonder that when John saw him, he fell down as if a dead man at his feet? Don't you think it stands to reason that if John so loved by the Lord, one of his inner circle, 
when he was with Jesus on this earth and walked with him and talked with him, laughed with him, ate with him, was taught by him. If John responded this way, if John described him in such glory and splendor, don't you think that this is the one who we are to hear, and rightfully so, that we should listen up? Should we not hear with such concentration that we hang on every one of his words? Well, in looking at who speaks to the seven churches, there is the description of the one who says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Now, let's look at the possessions of Jesus. It says in verse 16, in his right hand, he held seven stars. I'm not going to address any of that today, not anything at all. We are actually going to look more closely at that later when we get into the seven churches. I don't want to go down that trail today. We're going to deal with it as it's going to be talked about again. But for now, I want us to see what else is in his possession. He says, I have the keys of death and Haiti. Verse 18. Look over with me at Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. And while uh, you may be going there, in verses 1 through 13 of that chapter, it is speaking of us being his children through the Lord's death, the Lord's payment he made on our behalf. And it then picks up from there in verse 14, and it says there, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. And he has the keys to death and Hades. You see, death is man's worst fear, whether he admits it or not, in the world. We will spend our lives trying to fight it off. We will try to fight it off through medicine and through surgery, or we will hide its encroachment with cosmetics and amusement. But in the end, No one, short of the Lord coming back in the rapture for the church, in the end, no one will escape death. No one. And we all sit here with life and air in our lungs, but everyone here has experienced the sorrow and the tragic grief of the loss of a loved one through death. We will spend our lives dealing with it. And in the end, no one is going to escape death. In fact, all will succumb to it and take it to the bank. I'm dead serious. Oh, man, you almost have to laugh because sometimes the only thing you can do in the face of death is because of its tragic finality. And after death, there is Hades. That is hell. Death and hell. It isn't about death and taxes. Better be concerned about death and hell, which is man's worst fate. This is the place, if you remember, the rich man went to. The Bible says this in Luke 16. The rich man, he died and was buried. There is the physical death. And then the next moment, he was in Hades, in torment, in agony, and flames. Those are the words used, torment, agony, flames. There's spiritual death. Luke 16, 23 through 24. And this is never fond subject, and no one is ever excited to speak on these issues and it's pretty much lost in Christendom today. But how can you thank God for life if we don't deal with what he came for and deal with the death? It would be no big deal that he had the keys to Hades and death. 
Thank God there is a Jesus. He says, the living one who says, I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I've got the keys. I have the keys. I'm dead, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys. You see, Jesus, by his death and resurrection, has robbed death of its sting. He has robbed death of its power. Say he has robbed death of Satan's power over death and the grave of its victory. The grave no longer has victory to the believer. Death no longer has power over the believer. Death no longer has the sting and the finality of eternal torment and hell. He, because he is alive, because he, we saw earlier, paid the price, because he now has the keys to death. You see, he's basically saying he holds in his hands the keys that can free men from prison. Have you ever been put in lockup? When I was younger, I spent a night in lockup. Stupid, idiotic, foolish, sinful. But I didn't like it. I wanted to go home. But no one would let me out. I was stuck there. And in such a small way. Think of hell. There is no way out. It's forever. Men right now are already spiritually dead, and this is what we overlook. They may be physically alive, but until they are given eternal life and born again, they are already dead in their sin. They are in eternal bondage. They are, enga- they are enslaved to sin and death. But Jesus has the ability to come along and take those shackles off Come along and unchain you and free you. This is the one we should hear and listen to. And I thank God that he unfreed me, he let me out, and he said, follow me, you're now free. Are you thankful for that? So is he worthy to be listened to? So the description of Jesus, the possession of Jesus, now look at the location of Jesus. I love this. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. What's his location? John tells us that these golden lampstands are the seven churches we're going to be looking at coming up. They were literal, real churches in Asia at the time. And there were other churches in Asia at the time as well. But these seven are selected as representative of seven kinds of churches in any generation. And we're going to look at that again more fully starting next week. But I want you to notice a precious truth for us. Something beautiful. In this vision that Jesus gave to John, it's more precious than gold. Though Jesus is there in heaven, and though Jesus is the head of the church, he presents himself here as in the middle of the lampstands. He is in the midst of his local church. Isn't that beautiful? The emphasis in this opening revelation is that Jesus, everyone, is amongst us. He's close to us, and he cares for us. He is in the middle of all we do. He is where we are to help, to guide, to comfort, and to lead. How often have you at times in your life thought of Jesus as far off? That he is alive and just sitting up there somewhere in heaven. But Jesus said, I want you to always keep this in the forefront of your mind. I am in the midst of you. 
my body and my church, wherever it might be, I am in the midst of you. You know, when Jesus left this earth, he said some of the most comforting words you can imagine one needed to hear. He said the, this, I am with you always. Isn't that so comforting? But now he pictures that truth in the vision to John that I am with you and I am in the midst of you. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Do you believe that Jesus is here right now? He's here right now. He's in the midst of us now. Jesus is going to, throughout this, give us praise, and we're going to see encouragement. But in his love, he is going to give us his counsel and he's going to give us his corrections, and he's going to give us his warnings, and he's going to tell us what God calls us to do, what God calls us not to do or go through, and it will challenge. And at times, to choose to do right, it will cost us. But in it all, he wants us to know that in it all and through it all, he is in our midst and that he is with us always. I am here with you. What is one of the most classic illustrations of this? Can you think? What do you think? Does anyone come to mind one of the most classic illustrations of this? But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. And he said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is, what? Like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded, Shadrach! Meshach, Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. There you have it. That one, like a son of the gods, was none other than the Son of Man. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in their midst, just the very same Jesus John is referring to. Just like Jesus is in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, he's in the midst of the church today. And just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was in the midst of the fire with them, he is here with us today. Never forget that your Lord is with you always. When we have hearts to hear Jesus, when we have hearts to obey Jesus, follow Jesus, to go with him no matter where he leads us, no matter what he calls us to do. He is in our midst, and the world will know something about that. Don't overlook what Nebuchadnezzar said. When you're following him, loving him, living for him, hearing him, the world is going to know you are servants of the Most High God. They're going to see your testimony. They're going to see there's something about you that's so different. Well, in looking at this Jesus, we should hear the first description, the description, the possession, the location, and in closing today, we cannot overlook the compassion of Jesus. The compassion. As John laid there on the ground, he's crashed down as if he's dead. Imagine this. While he's laying down there like a dead man. John said, he placed his right hand on me, saying, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid, John. Wow. I love that. Do you love that? Don't you just love Jesus? 
What have we seen in these last three messages? Here, don't be afraid, is the faithful witness. Here is the firstborn of the dead. Here is the ruler of all kings. Here's the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, a judge and priest with all wisdom, all discernment, seen with eyes that know everything, a feet that will crush all rebellion. Here he is in all his sunshine and glory, and he stoops down, just like he stooped down to come into this world in Bethlehem to live for us and die for us. He stoops down, and he lays his right hand upon John and all of John's humanity and all of his weakness and all of his frailty, and he says, don't be afraid. Remember I asked you, what about the Jesus he walked with on this earth? Now, before him, he falls down dead. Well, now you see this Jesus that John walked with and talked with and fellowshiped with. This is the Jesus who we saw earlier in verse 5, loved us and released us from all our sins by his blood. And this is the Jesus in verse 18 who unlocked and unchained John from death and hell. This is the Jesus who walked with him and ate with him and hugged him and loved him and died for him. Isn't that awesome grace? But I want to be very clear this morning as we wind this down. Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to his bondservant, John. John who loved him and faithfully listened to him and followed him. He wasn't speaking to the lost. You see, there is a Jesus one must fear and the Jesus not to fear, and that depends on how one hears. Don't kid yourself. You won't hear this today. You better fear Jesus Christ. You better fear him if you rebel against him. He's not here to strike deals with you. He wants you to hear him. You see, this is a fearsome God. This is the fearsome God to those who do not fear him and do not hear him. If you are a person who does not hear God, does not fear God, does not live your life for God, refuses God, that he is only a God to fear, for you will only experience his just wrath, the one in the robe, the one with the feet, the one with the sash, the one with the eye. But to those who love him and revere him and are his bondservants, he, this fearsome God, he is our friend and he is our father. Just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself, praise God, knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. Our Lord Jesus knows what he's working with. And sometimes that's not good. And I thank God for his infinite compassion on me, do you not? And his patience with me. And that he loves me and guides me even now through all my weaknesses and all my failures. But he does know my heart. But when Jesus says, do not be afraid, we who believe in him can take that to the bank. He tells us why. He says, I am the first and the last. This is the very title that Jehovah God in the Old Testament takes upon himself. Let me read to you real quickly Isaiah 41.4. Who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first and the last. I am he. He says in 44.6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. And then he says in chapter 48, listen to me. There you have it. Listen to me. Are you going to hear? Even Israel, whom I called, I am he. I am the first. I am the last. Surely my hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. Here is Jesus. Jesus is God the Son. And the same right hand that founded the earth, 
The same right hand that spread out the heavens is the same right hand that reaches down and places on John and says, don't be afraid. And that is awesome. That is amazing. And this is who we're hearing. Wow. As we hear Jesus speak to the churches and as he speaks to us, you can rely on his compassion for you. But it is a compassion that should encourage us to never be afraid to follow him in whatever he says or does, wants us to do. Do you remember when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of the night? Do you remember that? And the wind and the waves were threatening to sink their little boat. And Jesus came walking to them on the water for they saw him and they were terrified. And Jesus said, take courage, everyone. It is I. Do not be afraid. And I love the next line. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped. Wow. Don't be afraid. Jesus, as we have seen, is in the midst of his church. He is in the boat of this life with us. No matter whether he calms the storm or not, he's there. Does that give you comfort? He always goes with us. And as we follow him, we need never be afraid. He can stop any wind and wave that might come against us and guide us through every storm. I'm closing now. I've praised him will come up. There is a song, When Jesus Goes With Me. Maybe you've heard it. It goes, it may be in the valley where dark danger lies. It may be in the sunshine under clear, peaceful skies. There's one thing for certain, be it dark or fair. When Jesus goes with me, I can go anywhere. I like green eggs and hamel. Yes, I do. It goes on to say this. I'll call it a privilege, his cross to bear. That's where we often fail. It's not mine to question my master's call. It's just mine to follow and give him my all. To ever be ready in my constant prayer. When Jesus goes with me, I can go anywhere. Do you believe that? Next week, the first of the seven churches. Will we have hearts to hear what Jesus says? We have seen in the introduction to this series how to hear. That's with your heart. Why we should hear. Because he loves you and died for you. And who are we to hear? The Almighty God. What is your view of Jesus? Do you see Jesus high, exalted, upon his throne? Do you see Jesus as someone whom you should fall down in reverence to and rise in obedience to? Well, this is the one we're going to hear. This is the one we must hear. Let's be a people to consider his cross to bear and realize what a privilege it is to serve him. Pray this week to do it with a heart of tenderness and authenticity and integrity out of love for him. And as he promised, we will be able to go anywhere and do anything he calls us to do. Amen, E.C. Grace. So let me ask you, is he worthy of that? Is he worthy of your praise? Is he worthy of your love? Is he worthy of all of your obedience? Is he worthy of your trust and your faith? I believe and know. Absolutely, he is. Let's stand.